Um, welcome everyone to our talk today about bio-inspired design and sustainability. My name is Becky Scheel and I'm from Harmonic Design. Harmonic is a service design firm in Atlanta, Georgia and founded by designers, Harmonic is a talented team of professionals who bring design into strategy. We'll be taking questions on um, Zoom and on YouTube towards the end of the session. So uh, keep those ideas coming or add some comments below. I think we had some original problems with our YouTube live stream, but I think we're on a new link now. Um, I'm really excited today to be joined by our panel, their collaborators and friends of mine, and I'm just really excited to see their faces. There is, we are very excited to welcome Ann Gerandellis, who is the head of design department in Drexel University's Westfall College of Media, Art and Design in Philadelphia. And Raja Shah, Program Director and Assistant Professor of Product Design, also at Drexel University's Westfall College of Media, Arts and Design. Both Anne and Raja teach bio-inspired design. And in addition to that, I was lucky enough to work with them on a project at the Digital Naturalism Conference in Panama last year. Welcome, Anne and Raja. Thanks. <laughs> to get started, I asked Anne and Raja to pick their favorite example of bio-inspired design for their Zoom background. So turning it back to you all, could you give an overview on why you picked this example? Sure, I can start. Um, I have an octopus uh, swimming behind me, which is just wonderful uh, for me. For me, um, the octopus is this fascinating thing that uh, really solves problems for us in terms of mobility and in terms of defense. So I love that the octopus has no bones and it's actually made of basically like water balloons. If you think of the, the a cross between the clown who makes the balloons and imagine that those are water balloons, the uh, octopus has that electros, that muscular hydrostat structure that allows it to go through a 600 pound octopus can go through the, a pipe the size of a quarter. So fascinating the way that they can move. Also that they can move, uh, they can walk like uh, very slowly, but they can also use those suction cups as real siphons to jet themselves forward. I think that's fascinating. And then they also have this three-dimensional skin that allows them to um, self-defend. Uh, it's a system of self-defense that allows them to change their color and their texture. Like how amazing is that? Love the octopus. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. R Raja, what do you have? So I have the water strider behind me you guys can see um i don't have a favorite anything i can't decide from day to day but this um weekend i went uh tubing on the brandywine creek near our house and these little guys were all over the water and i just find them super fascinating so the water strider actually is able to sort of suspend itself on water do the structure of its claws and it moves across in a sculling fashion, similar to sculling and rowing, which I used to row in school. And so this idea of being able to literally walk on water is fascinating, especially when you think about the idea of using the surface tension and the structure on these very small points. So we're so used to having things that are sort of floating on like long hulls, whereas it has these really tiny um, claws that allow it to rest on water and to walk across and really skate across. I think it has huge potential for mobility, um, especially as it comes to like water transportation and robotics. And um, a lot of people have been studying them to understand sort of like their movement and like how they sort of rest and float. So anything from planes and aircraft that need to float on water to also like any other sort of vehicles, I think it could have enormous potential for that. Um, and it's fun because my, my son was like, I'm gonna be walking on water. And we were walking over really shallow parts where he was really just standing on like small stones, but it looked like he was walking on water. I was like, you're like a water strider. So it got me really excited. So I decided to use that one for my inspiration today, but at any other time, it could be any other thing. It just depends on whatever I looked at last. Right, I'm, I'm with you. I like too many things. Um, and I also really love octopus. So both of those are fantastic examples. Uh, since you all are academics, I'm gonna go slightly into the academic realm. There's this wonderful research by Catherine Fu out of MIT that discusses design by analogy. Uh, she examines the methodology in bio-inspired design. 
And I'm really fascinated by one of her questions she asked in asking you all, how can we go about finding these elegant analogies without being well-versed in biology and or without counting on isolated experiences or chance? So how do you all, um, uh, through methods or other tools, uh, give your students and even yourselves in practice uh, better ways on accessing bio-inspired design? Um, so for me, it's it kind of comes from two different directions. One is you can be investigating and trying to solve a design problem. And I feel like when we are looking for inspiration and references as we're attacking different problems, one of the best ways we can sort of branch out and think expansively is by thinking through um, analogies, right? So if we're trying to contain something, we look for things that are also containing without saying we need to design a cup, right? So we try to abstract that word till it's like sort of like what it's really trying to do in terms of a function or behavior, right? And then we try to find analogous things that do that. So if you're just looking for product inspiration to design a product that contains, you might be looking for a cup, a bottle, a bladder, um, a leaf that's laying on the ground that may be containing water, um, people's mouths as their cheeks fill up and expand that might be containing water, right? So this idea of containing or holding in and then if we stick to products, then we're sort of limited to man-made solutions. But if we look to a way that nature has been able to contain things, then we also have an opportunity to investigate either even further and get other inspirations. And sometimes those inspirations can lead us to new, new and novel structures that we can try to simulate in our own work. But then there's also the running across a piece of a fascinating biology and wanting to grab hold of that. And I think um, Anne can talk a little bit about sort of taking the analysis of a biological organism and ways to sort of categorize and break down um, what it's really doing out in nature and then sort of keeping that in your back pocket to use later on or to take inspiration from that directly. Yeah, I think that's great, Raja, and I agree 100%. The analogical thinking is what seems to be most difficult for folks. Um, the I got involved with bioinspired design through the Center for Biologically Inspired Design at Georgia Tech. And uh, we were uh, doing workshops at science fairs and things, and we were presenting biological, uh, biologically inspired design solutions to, to students. And they were like, wow, that's so amazing. That's great. And when it came to design their own, it was very, very difficult. They just wanted to go to the internet and search some more. And so we found that. Um, breaking things down into what structure is there? Um, how does that structure behave? Like for the octopus, the structure is these water balloons. How does it behave? Well, they can push it and pull it and move it in different ways. Um, and then what function does that serve? So that allows the octopus to move in a certain way. And when we learned, helped and helped students to develop a way of looking at the world, to analyzing it through this, what we call the SBF structure, it was really helpful. And um, the other thing that was really helpful was helping students to understand how visualization plays a role. So we need to learn to look closely at things and we need to learn to draw. So the processes that we use, so we did develop a, a card system that was super helpful, but the process that we found was really helping students be very curious about the world around them by looking at it and just kind of turning everything off, stopping, looking at it and drawing it was really helpful. Um, and then identifying the problems that plants and animals are solving, like Raj has been talking about, and how they might relate to human problems. And then understanding the structures, the behaviors and the form functions and how they work together. Yeah, and I remember you have these fantastic cards and they are awesome. Um, and also, I when I worked at the zoo, Raja would take her uh, industrial design classes, and I would go out there and try to help them become inspired. And it, it is very difficult. Um, I was kind of fascinated to see all these new tools. Um, for instance, there is an online tool where it's a portal for discovery called Ask Nature. I'm sure Anne and Raja are familiar with it, but it's a website where you could go in and type. Um, how energy conservation, and it'll give you lots of really great examples in nature to refer to. Um, what do you all think about um, tools like that? Are they helpful? Are they a little too prescriptive? Or are they just a really wonderful source of inspiration? 
I think that they're awesome because I, I mean, we, that's is their culture, right? That's is what we're doing now as we're running into the, the internet to ask it everything. So I think that they're fine. What I love about them is they ca- kind of help people understand different ways of doing searching. So like thinking about the search heuristics in order to find inspiration, in order to find different details, um, what sort of words they're parsing in order to pull those together. And for a lot of students, and I think you know you learn this in like your first library search class, is you can't just type in the one thing that you're looking for. You can't just say, how do, what does sloths do for biological thing spider design? You're not gonna find that direct link. What you need to be thinking about is what are the behaviors that you want to be um, looking for? What are the different features that you wanna be looking at? Um, what are some of the functions that you're trying to solve for? And then putting in as many different versions of those words as possible um, in your search in order to find it. And so I think, by participating in bid or biologically inspired design and thinking through all the different ways that nature might be doing that is it changes your brain to think more expansively about the way you're defining and um, different things that you're doing with your design projects. So the search engines themselves are really teaching you how to search better. Um, and I think also the particularly ask nature is fairly robust and it oftentimes you'll be looking for something like a bee because I don't know why you're looking for a bee. Maybe you're looking for something that can sort of gather um, gather and and hold things and carry things on its body, all like on its exterior. And so you want something that can sort of like passively pick things up like it picks up pollen. But what you'll find is if you look in for bees carrying pollen or carrying, you'll find so many other different natural inspirations that you can also use. So you might think that the bee is the biological organism that's gonna be the key to you unlocking some innovation, but really you find it's another similar animal or another similar feature on another completely different type of organism like a plant instead. Um, So I love the way that it pulls those together. There are definitely different ways that people's brains sort of enter into and understand bid. And I do think that having different strategies to sort of pick and choose from at a start is a really good place to begin before you develop sort of your own methods. I do, I, I agree 100%. I think that the um, Ask Nature is fantastic for looking at functions and to understand how I need to solve a problem of water storage. What other animals and plants, how do they solve problems of water storage? It's fantastic in that sense. But I think we have to be careful about using it as the only tool. And of course you, we wouldn't do that, but realize what it can do for us and what it can't. So it can't help us understand kind of how that tool works very specifically, how it's similar, like how it might work in bees and how it's similar, how it's different from wasps and hornets. So I think to supplement Ask Nature, we really need to go out in the world, first of all, just really go out there and draw it. Again, I'm always gonna be an advocate of that. But um, to talk to, to go to nature centers. I mean, those that have had such luck with nature centers, those are people who spend time, they know all this stuff. They're not necessarily scientists, although some of them are, and they have wonderful, wonderful observations. And to realize that they're a fantastic resource for us. Um, The museums at Drexel, we're really lucky that we have our natural science museum as part of um, Drexel University. So they're fantastic. But, you know, so we took students there, but they're looking at a bunch of dead stuff, uh, which is, helpful in some ways, helps you to see the structure, doesn't help you to see their behavior at all. Go to the zoo to see their behavior, watch videos online to see their behavior and how that's working. Um, but the I really would encourage during this time, it's great to reach out to museum experts, museum, the folks in the museums who are normally there, they love being experts and offering advice. So they're a really great resource. Um, biologists are wonderful, but they're like an expert in one thing. So we, we went to the um, the Natural Science Museum at Drexel. We we went to the mollusk guy because he was available that day for half an hour. And I learned so much about mollusks, but like he doesn't know anything about the grasshoppers and there's thousands of grasshoppers in this other section. So it's really interesting to identify kind of what you're studying and why at different times. Cool. I, I totally agree with you being able to like be inspired by your place and uh, seeing different modes of it working. Um, given 
that you all are both professors in Philadelphia and I live in downtown Atlanta. Can you talk about the impact of being outside in an urban environment and how might we look for nature inspiration in urban settings? So I, I'll start with this one. I live right in downtown Philly and I don't have a car. And so I am like as urban as you can get. And so it's a great question because I'm kind of like longing for, but we've got a river. Um, so I would say in an urban setting, I think it's really fascinating to pay attention to how things are changing. So I like walk the same route every day so I can see how things are changing. And it's really nice to just keep a journal uh, or take photos, but do little drawings to see how things are changing around you. I think that's really cool to document your seasonal walks. It's so different in winter than it is during spring and fall. Um, and to pay attention to what do you see? Not just what you see, but what, what do you see? What do you hear? What are you touching? Um, what are you tasting? What are you smelling? How is it different? And just to make note of that in a journal, I think is really fantastic. And then the great thing about cities, we do have fantastic museums, fantastic museums with really great collections and really great experts. So we've got more access to experts and I think that that's really helpful. Um, but walking places instead of taking a car has been the most wonderful, wonderful thing that just puts me out in nature. I had to learn and Raja taught me to get the big coat that goes all the way down to my ankles in the winter, but now I can just go, go, go in any weather and I see things that I didn't see before and smell things and taste things. That's really wonderful. And um, I think that, you know, the challenges of living in an urban environment are, are are fairly immense, but I think that we have to remember that nature comes in all shapes and sizes and nature will always find a way. So even if you're walking through dense urban areas like, say, Manhattan and you run across pigeons, right, that's nature. Um, <laughs> if you're looking at the moss that's growing on the side of the buildings, that's nature. If you find lichen stored somewhere, that's nature. The maggots that are eating the carcass of the dead rat and the alley, that's nature, right? And so the question is, are we talking about natural inspiration in terms of like outdoors, just being outdoors and, and sort of like the force bathing? Or are we really talking about trying to figure out what are ways that nature is solving key problems in it's whatever the ecosystem is. And these ecosystems can be urban, they can be suburban. Um, I happen to live just outside of Philadelphia in the immediate suburbs about a mile away from the um, city border. And where I am, there's lots of access to, first of all, park. City parks are a great place to just sort of get away from things. Small botanical gardens, nature centers, as Anne was saying. But, you know, once you have even a little plot of land, like you can really start to see things, anything from like the way that ferns are popping up in different places, the way that grass is organized and structured, um, even looking at our very tiny um, biological friends and insects and bugs, right? So right now we're all studying the spotted lanternfly and all the science out there is about how destructive they are to the sugar maple and other trees. But if you look at the way that they actually perform and watch them, they are amazing little bugs that can like, they I don't even, they, they sort of detect the shadows that come up behind them and they can leap like six, seven feet to get out of the way. So it's really hard to swat them because they're really smart and the way that they move is fascinating as well. So, you know, nature is at all scales. It's um, also at the nano scale. It's, you know, at the cellular scale. So you can study some of these specimens under a microscope, which, you know, you can buy accessories for mobile phones now that allow you to look up very closely. So it doesn't always have to be about walking through an, an, a natural environment and hearing the brooks and hearing the birds. Um, you can really start to take things and analyze them um, at a at structural scale, at a cellular scale, looking at the small, um, systems and then also looking at larger things as well. But I think that if we're looking for um, inspiration in urban environments too, one of the things that we might also look for is what are some of the problems related to nature or the lack thereof that we think that nature could help to solve. And one of the things that um, you find a lot in places that are um, 
have large hardscapes is the lack of trees in terms of their air filtration rate. So in terms of a natural system that's providing shade, shelter for organisms, but it's also helping with heat dispersal and also helping filter the air. Like when we don't have nature there, then we actually are presenting more problems. And so oftentimes we're looking for man-made solutions to some of those things. And how can we how do we either supplement or replicate that in a different way? So that's something that a lot of times we can think about. But, you know, we also, you know, the talk is also talking about sustainability a little bit. And if we look at a lot of the effects of global warming and climate change, oftentimes those things happen first um, in cities and along coasts. Um, and we can really see the effects of those. And so if we look again back at how nature would have solved that and what we've sort of taken away, the question is, what can we put back? And if we can't wait for natural systems to take over quickly enough, what can we as people invent and put in its place to help mitigate some of those impacts? Yeah, um, so many things to, uh, I'd like to dig in a little bit more there. Um, I live in Atlanta and it has the largest percentage of tree canopy um, and it presents itself with a lot of uh, pollen, <laughs> but it also um, does a very good job with uh, storm irrigation, we get uh, these crazy thunderstorms and all those root systems help with that. Um, so I uh, have done a lot of research in that, so I agree. And I also, I mean, I look out my window all the time now during COVID and I look at the squirrels and the birds. So lots of inspiration just even outside your window. But the thing I wanted to ask you about <laughs> is um, you were recently, Raja, you were recently talking to John Maida on his uh, LinkedIn talks and you mentioned um, that you uh, kind of sometimes ask your students to look not through a human-centered lens, but a society-centered lens. And what I'm curious is as we're adapting these nature things, you know, who are we designing for? What lens do we look through? Um, internally, we've been trying to kind of look at how do we look at things through a planet-centric or an ecosystem-centered view to like really solve the problem, not just for humans, but for, uh, everyone in the ecosystem. And I was wondering if you put any thought about that. Yeah, I, so I think, you know, human centeredness is wonderful. First of all, I shouldn't make it sound like throughout human centered design. I think the human centered design and the structures around that in terms of design thinking and all the tools and methodologies are really important. Um, but I think it's short sighted because when we focus on a single person or a single person's experience, we're often ignoring other people. Um, and so oftentimes that human represents a very small percentage of the population. And solving for one thing often creates issues, problems, or leaves out other things. And so society-centered design is a far more inclusive look at how we approach design and um, the processes and also who we're designing for. And one of the things that society-centered design forces you to look at is looking at all the things that touch um, your decisions related to society. And it includes health, it includes equity, um, it includes looking at economic systems, it includes looking at social structures, it includes looking at how the environment affects people. Um, so it's all those decisions and all those different sort of influences compared, like paired with those decisions. And I think that that's something that we often sort of lose sight of in terms of the complexity of design decisions. And if we look at when we have not thought through a society-centered lens and sort of ignored some of those issues, the impacts and fallouts of those, we often don't experience until years, decades later. But then if we had just thought through some of those potential societal impacts of those choices, um, we perhaps could have made better choices. And I think when we think about like issues of sort of sustainability, it's very animal centered um, as well. Like people always wanna, and I grew up in the save the whales generation. So just so we're clear, but it's like, when I talked to my young neighbors the other day, they saw some trash and like, someone's not saving sea turtles. But I was like, someone is not caring for the environment that people also live in and other animals also live in. But to them, pollution equals sea turtles are dying, right? When really, if we think about like systemic racism, especially environmental racism, a lot of that has to do with pollution of our waterways and pollution of our um, like neighborhoods and other, and other places that we coalesce and congregate and the way that we move through things. So when we, and then and pollution is a human problem and it's a society problem. It is a natural problem, but nature will always be 
okay unless we like kill it off. It if we walked away from from this planet today and we all got on a spaceship and left, the Earth would be fine, right? Um, and so what we really need to understand is when we treat the Earth poorly, we're actually treating our home poorly. So we really need to take care of it. But and it is our responsibility to not beat up on the animals and their ecosystems and, and their things. But a lot of those things really do impact us as a society as well. So nature and and the planet, I mean, people on the planet are are symbiotic. And we have to remember that we are just as much of an organism of the planet as any other animal is. Absolutely. And I think that the human-centered design um, when it came about, it was really about us as consumers and we're not just consumers. And that's what's so important to think about. We're communities and we're communities in, in living on the whole earth. The mollusk guy was the one who said, global warming, don't worry, Anne, we got it. I said, what do you mean we got it? He said, the mollusks will survive. <laughs> Humans won't, but the mollusks will survive. So I do think that, um, that this society-centered design that includes people and the planet is fundamental. And I really appreciate you bringing it up. I think it's a fantastic question, Becky. Yeah, and um, internally we're trying, we're talking more about sustainability and how we can incorporate it into our practice. Um, you all have been uh, teaching bio-inspired design for so long and you're so good at it. Um, is there a specific way, is there, a way we can approach bio-inspired design that speaks to sustainability? Is some of it kind of inherently ingrained or is there, or is there something we can push further on? Raja, unmute. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, sorry, I muted myself. So actually there's a few areas I think that we, we've taught to um, when we're thinking about how to pair bio-inspired design to sustainability, because you can apply bio-inspired design to literally anything from the clothing, from fashion to whatever, right? But if we look at like, what are the key areas or topics related to sustainability that someone might focus their energies on, be there from a systems design point of view, from a product design, industrial design, engineering point of view. And you know, there's kind of some low hanging fruit here. Um, one would be like waste and pollution, which is why something I just brought up um, and looking at ways that nature solves that. And I think that's one of the most immediate things that we as consumers are often held responsible for, which is managing our own waste and policing our own pollution or um, voting in people that put in infrastructure in place to help manage those systems, right? So we have our waste management systems that are locally um, here in the US, but that does not exist the world over necessarily. So since we've been making things, we've been thinking about ways to dispose of things in a, in a responsible way or not, right? So waste and pollution is sort of like that human problem. The other thing that I was talking about um, earlier would be also related to sort of environmental racism. And that that often has to do with sort of like the clear cutting and deforestation of some of these urban areas where some of our um, poorest communities happen to reside. Um, and that means those cities, those places, those neighborhoods often do not have the same um, healthy air, the same availability to do this forest bathing or the benefits of the shading that happens naturally from um, tree canopies. So like that is also one of the issues. Um, then there's a couple of other ones that people are probably very familiar with, which is like clean renewable energies, um, global warming, climate change, um, conservation, which is protecting um, na natural systems, natural ecosystems, um, natural animals, um, particular plants. Um, and then also thinking of it through the lens of taking nature and applying it sort of green chemistry. And those would be like your green products, products that aren't baked with hormones, other harmful chemicals that we create and produce. So those would be sort of like the main areas that I would say that you can find really quick inspiration from nature to, um, to look at problems, to relate to problems in those categories. And, and that's what I think is key. Um, it's looking at bio-inspired design as problem solving. Like what are the problems that we need to solve? And the animals and plants that are in our world have been prototyping for thousands of years. They got some of this figured out. We've got a lot to learn from them. <laughs> I love that you just said they're prototyping. That's wonderful, Anne. 
Um, I picked a sloth background uh, because I'm fascinated by the sloth um, uh, life of, uh, they're slow, so they develop algae, and then the algae protects them from predators because they're very slow in the forest. <laughs> and so I, I think that's a really interesting um, system they have, and it that kind of stuff really influences my work in service design. And uh, at Harmonic, we practice service design, and so I was wondering. Um, I feel like a lot of times bio-inspired design is applied uh, mostly to engineering and products. But if you thought about things like systems and services, do you have any really great bio inspiration examples in the realm of services design or even outside product design and engineering? <laughs> I don't have any specifics, but I think that there is absolutely a strong relationship that we need to pursue further. Um, I think that service design includes solving complex problems, right? Um, it includes designing behaviors of one person and of many people. Um, and it's looking at structural systems that prompt those behaviors, physical or otherwise. That's all that structure, behavior, and function is exactly what bio-inspired design is ready to do. And I think that it's um, the process of ethnography that, that service designers go through, this notion of understanding these human systems um, and the way that we as uh, bio-inspired designers look at the uh, analyzing the plant and animal systems, I think that there is lots to learn. And I think that there's so many ways that systems of plants and animals work together. Um, and I love that systematic approach. We are talking now about possibly um, designing a, a junior project for our product design students in the fall that really looks at how can we do a better job of designing sustainable communities? Like, and they can interpret that in different ways, but we're at a point in time where we don't have healthy, diverse communities. And um, there are many animals that are working together to collaborate, to communicate well, um, that are very adaptable, that manage disturbances in certain ways. Those are all things that would help if we could understand those, they would help us to build better communities. I mean, the elephant, for example, I love that the elephant, you, know, you always see those funny little YouTube videos of the elephant walking around with a dog or the elephant befriends all these different animals. And it's because elephant needs to get stuff done. And the elephant has this awareness of what the elephant can do and what the other animals can do. So they will often befriend a monkey that will climb up into the tree and keep a lookout while the elephant digs the trough so that they both can have water and be safe, right? So, I mean, these wonderful things that, that, uh, that systems that exist can help us to look at our systems and how animals are solving problems in this very systematic way that can not only help one person, but it helps us all communicate better, work better together. And I think we have a lot of work to do on that front. I, I love looking at organisms that live in colonies as well because there's always some sort of like hierarchy and designation of sort of like skills and responsibilities that people, uh, people, the people, the you know, like the, especially the insects do dutifully. <laughs> <laughs> they get their job done, right? And that keeps the system running efficiently. I remember last summer we were studying the leaf cutter ants, and it was just really fascinating to understand, like the sort of like the organizational structure of like how they were able to not only go out, collect, and cut the leaves, bring them back, chew them up, you know what I mean, um, digest, and then create sort of like these concrete structures, which really became the building blocks, literally the building blocks um, of their colony. Um, in which they resided in. And even the organization of that colony was like very intentional. And so I think this idea of if we can study these organisms and understand that there is some level of consciousness and awareness of like what you're supposed to be doing. And I don't know if there's some motivation of why there's not, a, I don't know if there's a philosophical, but it seems that um, when you look at even from the great apes to these tiny little ants, right, that there seems to be this sense of hierarchy and understanding of the relationships between folks and the diversity of roles within there and the numbers of 
of, of community members that are participating. And I think that really does hint back to what Anne was talking about in terms of thinking about our own communities, especially sustainable communities, and where the diversity lies within how we're organized as well, as opposed to trying to do everything homogenous and everybody aspiring to be the same thing. It really needs to be inclusive of everyone's expertise, everyone's roles, everyone's backgrounds, everyone's cultures, and then to figure out where our strengths lie. Well, I've always wanted to bring leaf cutter ants and Nick and mole rats into uh, my design workshops. And now I think you gave me a really good reason. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned Panama. So um, I, I mentioned earlier, and Raja and I worked on this project where we went to this really amazing uh, conference in Gamboa, Panama called the Digital Naturalism Conference. And um, we met a lot of really interesting artists and technologists. And I was kind of fascinated by this one group we met uh, the Bio Art Collective where um, they all go into nature and they paint. And it, I think it really spoke to a lot of things Anne mentioned about immersion and drawing. Um, can you all uh, recommend anything um, similar to them or can we all hack our own Bio Art Collective? What are some simple things we can do or organizations we can join? I think it's, I think, Stopping looking and drawing is like a number one important thing um, and helping us see in different ways. Art museums, um, classes online, learning to draw. There's a lot of free drawing online classes. So many people see themselves as either I draw or I don't draw. Actually, there is this wonderful gray range where you can, you can draw crappy and you can still learn lots of things by drawing crappy. You're learning to look. That's the most wonderful thing about learning to draw. Um, citizen design citizen science groups in neighborhoods are so fantastic. Um, you know, the one that identified all of the squirrels in this neighborhood and mapped them in certain ways. I mean, it's just fantastic. Um, so I think um, visual data systems are also really interesting and are tied to bio-inspired design in that way. Um, nature centers are great. Any way that you can hang out with a biologist. I mean, I just had the most fun when I just, uh, went with a biologist to the zoo, they see things so differently than we do. And it's just, it made me fascinated at every turn. Um, the Biomimicry Institute is also a great place. Um, Georgia Tech Center for Bio-Inspired Design is really fantastic. They've got a tab there that has resources um, that are, it's filled with many, many resources that we put together for teachers um, to learn how to bring uh, uh, Bio-Inspired Design into their curriculum. Um, workshops at science festivals. So I love that that as you're talking about, Becky, bioinspired design connects the science um, and the arts, right? And so hanging out in both of those worlds and bringing the other with you, even if it's a friend from science to the zoo or someone from art class um, to go observe nature with you, it's really wonderful to bridge those across. Everybody that I've had that experience with of coming from one discipline and moving across to the other is fascinated and really enjoys it. So it's a great way to invite new friends to do wonderful things. <laughs> um, and a few years ago, I actually got to participate in this wonderful workshop ran by um, Karen Fuchs, who's actually writing a book. Um, and she has a drawing from nature curriculum and it is fascinating. Um, so the drawing from nature curriculum, you actually don't do as much drawing as you would think. It's looking at different um, patterns and organizations within mostly botanical specimens, but some, uh, some animal specimens and insects as well, but looking closely and sh shaping descriptions through drawings, through impressions, through prints, through modeling. So she has it sort of divided into branching as a structure. So we're looking at trees and fractals and how they're organized through everything from a snowflake to tree branches to like how lightning splits off to the ways that our um, neurological system and a circulatory system in our body is organized. So understanding those branching structures and the logics and the math embedded in there. Um, she also talks a lot about um, spirals and understanding like the order of those. So how those relate to um, other proportional systems like, you know, we always want to talk about Fibonacci, but looking at how that shows up in everything from broccoli um, to other like, so, you know, you're we talking about like, how do I access nature? You know, go to a produce stand like that. You can, it's everywhere. It's in our food. It's, you know, in the 
pigeons that are pooping on the sidewalk. So it's kind of like, you know, we can find it. So if you find a feather, if you find a leaf, if you find the structure of anything like that, you can sort of understand and start to visualize these branching structures and look through, look at those in order to understand those. Um, she also looks at sort of like um, radials, radial patterns, um, star patterns, retroform patterns, which are like in mesh structures, that we do a lot of these simulation and computer uh, modeling, right? We're always trying to figure out how do we create sort of sort of a logical um, form generation system, right? And oftentimes they're based on the mathematics that we're finding in natural orders and systems and structures because they're very efficient in the way that they grow and replicate and reproduce. Um, I, she's more, she's more, um, but I, I put her link in here. Um, I don't know if it came, it doesn't look like it's a, it's a came in as a link, but if you look at KarenFuchsHome.com and look at her drawing from nature curriculum, um, a book to BD. I, Karen, I don't know if you're, I don't know if she's, she's probably not here, but I'm plugging her book. Uh, so she, now she has to do it. She says she's been working on it slowly. So I'm very excited for it. Cool. And uh, I added in, uh, Anne mentioned the squirrel census, which was in Inman Park, which is an Atlanta neighborhood. And then, um, uh, when I was at the zoo, we worked with Frog Watch, which is the really cool citizen science thing. And then oh, my old zoo coworker uh, put in a uh, SciStarter.org. Hi, Rachel. Um, so lots of really great organizations. And I, I think citizen science is very groovy indeed. Um, so <laughs> I, you all hit on this a lot, but I was wondering, um, given the times we live in, uh, with COVID, uh, climate change. Uh, Raja, you mentioned, thank you for bringing up um, uh, intersectional environmentalism or, or racism and, and sustainability. Uh, there's so many terms for it right now. Um, just seems to be kind of a disconnect. And you all gave like a lot of great things like go for a walk, uh, look out your window more, look at broccoli and go to the food stand. But what can designers, um, do um, either through their work or their methods to kind of pull in this to make a better connection to nature when they're creating, whether it's co-creation or, or teaching your class or, or doing your own design work, what are some things designers can be mindful of to make a better connection with nature? I think that's the hard thing. Like we'll take a class or we'll go to a workshop or we'll understand a theory, but applying it, in your daily practice is really hard. And I, that's why I think that if we can, in that research and understanding phase of design, wherever we're trying to tackle it, um, if we can be inclusive of conversations about how what we're doing affects our larger society and our larger network system that is related to the planet, then we can also start to pay attention and keep our minds tuned to what the plan is doing to solve that problem. Because I'll tell you, um, nature is way smarter than us and much more efficient and has had mo millions of years of adaptations, um, billions, right, of being able to understand how to solve these problems. So I think Anne mentioned like, you know, multiple iterations, multiple prototypes. Everything in nature is a prototype where it's learning to adapt and evolve. Um, and so looking to nature actually really helps us shortcut some of the things that we're struggling to do on our own. Not everything has to be biologically inspired, but there's so many things that are so easy to um, come up with an analogy to, even looking at energy systems, right? Um, looking at how our own bodies are fueled, looking at how plants are fueled. So now we're creating, you know, for the last 50 years, we've been really working on commercializing solar panels, trying to get as efficient at nature at capturing and storing the energy of the sun, right? How do we capture it? How do we put it? How do we understand how those photo cells might be similar to the cells on the, the, the tops of a leaf, right? When we're looking at solving other issues, like for instance, um, the in South Africa and Johannesburg, they're approaching like the, uh, day zero or actually i think we are in day zero where they're running out of like clean drinking water and so we have an ocean that's super abundant with water but it, we can't consume it because it's salt water right so how has nature been able to desalinate and that's where you look if you look at a lot of different projects related to this they're oftentimes making references to natural systems and how they are able to desalinate um, the water from the ocean and turn it into something that's useful for like a mangrove tree, for instance. Um, that, that same sort of system can be very useful for us as people, right? So putting 
aside sort of our own egos and thinking that we can come up with it and by hammering it together with the materials and the know-how that we have, which are like hammers and nails and 3D printers and CAD programs and looking at how nature does it, will push us down the road to a very efficient solution much, much faster. Um, so that's, in my mind, it should be part of that early inspiration. You should always be looking there just to see what's out there. And inevitably, I think that we'll always find some ways to be more efficient about the way we produce things. Cool. <laughs> Uh-oh, Anne. I'm talking to my computer. Sorry, thank you. Um, I think it's, uh, I'm very interested in tackling these bigger questions. I mean, even if you just look at the UN sustainability goals, like how, uh, how can we not have any hungry people? Um, how do animals do this? They, they've figured it out. This is where ask nature is really helpful because you can ask like storing water um, and then you look at everything that's in the desert. Well, how do they handle this? And you can look at the plants and animals and all the different systems that they have. Um, but even in terms of, we want quality education for everyone. How do those leaf cutter ants, there's zillions of, I mean, it's unbelievable how many there are. How do they learn their role in this colony, right? And there are ways that they teach each other. So they lay down that pheromone trail. Um, and I had a horrible accident. I felt really bad. We were taking photos of this fantastic colony of leafcutter ants going down. And I slipped and I stepped right in the middle of the colony, and of the trail. I mean, as they were moving to it, and I'm like, oh, so first of all, I was just devastated. Like, I'm like, I wanted to look so closely that I, I mean, I stepped on some, it was horrible. But the way that they cleaned that up was amazing. Like within a minute, they had cleaned up all the leaves, they carried them out of the way, they'd reestablished the path. I mean, it was unbelievable. So it's just really interesting. And they cleaned up their, de their dead comrades too. They did, they did, they carried them. Um, and so I think that there, these big problems are the ones that, that nature does so well. But I also think that there's two parts of bio-inspired design. And this inspiration part is one where people get all excited. And, but then it's like, oh, crap. I'm not an ant. I can't figure out. I don't have pheromones that I can lay down. Um, and so we've got to look very carefully at what our bodies can do and what are the materials that we have right now and what can they do and what they can't do. And that's a really exciting part of bio-inspired design, I think, where it's of age because there's so much technology now that is making things possible that, was, that wasn't possible before. So there are ways that we can mimic nature in new ways that help us to function as nature functions. So I think it's really exciting, but I think we absolutely, we have to take on these big goals. It's super important. Awesome. Um, I wanted to uh, check in with the audience to see if anyone has any questions. Um, and I'll, I'll ask one of my, uh, I'll ask a question in between. So if you have any questions, please comment. Um, I have one from my coworker who texted me. Um, but if you could change one thing, um, uh, kind of going into this and in the design community to be more mindful uh, and of the impact of sustainability, what would it be? I mean, I, we kind of hit on some of these things before, like, yeah, uh, there's, uh, design is half of being inspiration and then, and now what exactly what, what Anne was saying. Um, but in, as a community, uh, how can we be more mindful uh, of sustainability? I mean, for me, and I, this is gonna, it's, this is a hard one to say, I, we just need to make less stuff. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's, we need to move around less and we need to make less stuff. Those are very hard to do. And it's hard for me to say as someone who is an industrial designer um, who l travels to get places, right? Um, but it's clear that the manufacturing and the way that we've been going about it is one of the largest contributors to climate change in addition to our ability to get around the planet, right? Um, it also has created large inequities in the way that those goods are distributed and those communities in which those goods are made. So when you think about this idea of making things um, and the way that we've been able to do that with advances in 20th and 21st century technologies as now we're in the fourth industrial revolution, um, we're making more stuff more faster, more cheaper. Um, and all of that means that we have more waste that we have not been able to efficiently manage. 
um, we are putting a lot of the onus and responsibility on the end consumer, but we've trained them in a culture where they want to consume more things and we, we are, we're replacing things at a much more rapid pace because we're able to sort of upgrade things. And we've also been really um, intentional about designing away um, affordances for repair, um, affordances for caring for things. Um, and we've made cheap products so ubiquitous and widespread that it's irresistible to be able to get those things because they are widely available. Um, so for me, designers really need to be thinking of ways that we can create solutions that don't require, and it's like I said, it's hard for me to say as an industrial designer, that don't require the need for mass manufacture of goods unless it's absolutely necessary. Knowing that those goods drive our economies, knowing those goods employ people, knowing that those goods do those things. So we really need to be thinking from a policy standpoint about how we can, first of all, not need as much. And when we do need, we're very intentional about the way that we're designing. We're very cognizant of its impact on society, its future impact on the society and the planet. And then we are coming up with infrastructure to responsibly handle any of those goods. So thinking about design in a circular way is probably the most important thing that all people across various industries need to be considering is always keeping that entire cycle in mind as we go into the world producing anything, be it a digital product, be it a service experience, or be it a physical good. Um, we have to be cognizant of that. And that circular approach to design where we're thinking, we're designing with the quote unquote end of life in mind, and we're thinking about how that feeds back into a larger system or loop or ecosystem is gonna be critical to how we move forward, being conscious that design drives economies, being conscious that people want new things, um, and being conscious that we can also design in behavior change in the way that we introduce products into the world. Agreed. I think for me, that question, whatever action I'm performing, who is most negatively impacted by this decision I'm making? Just asking that question, that makes us all live more sustainably. And to really answer that question, we have to understand systems and just to think about things more in terms of systems. Um, I'm really glad that you're thinking about how bid affects service design because I think that you are a great looker at these systems, Becky. So I'm just so excited what you're doing. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, uh, and I was excited that you all brought up uh, circular economy and circular design. It's something we're, we're definitely uh, taking a bigger look at. We have a, a really some really great questions over here. Um, when I was from Lucy, she says, do you think there's a way to use bio-inspired design in the tech world? A lot of physical design is shifting to digital, also service, there's a servitization of product. And I'm curious as to whether there is a way to incorporate bio-inspired design in digital products or when technology is involved. Great question, Lucy. Good to hear from you. Um, <laughs> I, I do. I think it, because our tech solutions are not just, um, it's not just physical technology, right? We're designing technical solutions to change people's behavior. And that's really what bio-inspired design is about. And so stepping back and not thinking about how can I make this look like a, a bat wing in the way that it stretches, it's, it's not so much about that, but it's about how we influence human behavior. And that's what you are so great at. Um, and in the tech world, we have such wonderful tools to change human behavior. But to think about what's the problem that we're trying to solve and what are the behaviors that we want and to look at biology to help us to do that. Because the biological systems are looking at how we move. I mean, you can think about how we communicate things, that's really, really important. And looking, that's the one I think that has the most direct link between how do we solve communication product, plants and animals solve communication problems and how could they influence us in the tech world. Um, but I also think it's in terms of uh, cooperation as well, that understanding how animals cooperate, building our tech world in such a way that we're learning to cooperate with other platforms, other parties. Um, so those are the two direct ways that I see that there's real potential, but I think that there are many, many more when we're thinking about it in terms of human behavior. 
And then I would also, um, not to push back on the question, but until we somehow get holograms to work, we're always going to be interacting with those digital things through physical interfaces, screen, whatever, right? So we, I think, first of all, on the digital side of things, you know, we're talking about behaviors, but we can also be talking about sort of like um, how we navigate interfaces. And I think what we've done a lot of in terms of flattening UX and UI is to create these user interfaces that are predictable and standardized. But nature is not that way. Nature is, adapt nature is adaptable to different contexts and different uses. And I think that we re need to remember that even though it's easier to have these like catalogs of icons and things like that that everybody can just copy from and just change the color of, um, that that is creating a hierarchy of what is standard good design in terms of UX and digital experiences. And anyone who comes at design of digital displays or interfaces um, from a different lens, we are sort of sidelining them and saying that their their work or their influences are less than because they're not trained to use these tools that now they've only emerged in the last five years, let's be honest, right? So I think um, thinking about how nature navigates and communicates in terms of hierarchy structures and system architectures, I think that that gives us a lot of license to be able to similarly diversify the sort of infrastructures and site architectures in which we are creating things for people to interact with. Um, but the other side of that is we all always are going to have this sort of pairing between physical and digital things. And I don't think people are designed to only want digital. Like people us like as a society as a culture for all of our existence have been creating these physical goods we're going to want these physical goods we're still going to be sitting in chairs and on beds and as the world and some of these products can be replaced by digital services we're still going to be react in interacting with them through these physical interfaces these connected interfaces these internet of things interfaces or these like paired interfaces right so i think that we still have to pay attention to what that physical product design experience and the sustainability around that and then i think just the digitizing it really helps with sustainability and then looking for biological inspiration on navigating infrastructure navigating the system infrastructure and and then controlling or trying to understand the behaviors that these digital experiences are creating in terms of the entire system cool awesome i want to get to one more question um from Andrea Ray, she, she says, COVID-19 has highlighted many social, political, and environmental issues. Have you thought or recognized any opportunities for bio-inspired solutions to tackle these problems? Great question, Andrea. <laughs> and that's a hard one. <laughs> it, is a, it is a great question. And, and for me, I think that um, it's this isolation is the one thing that has uh, been most problematic for me, just um, seeing people actually somewhat comfortable in their isolation. And so that's one reason why I really want to run this project where we're looking at how can we look at bio-inspired design to help us understand how we need diverse communities to move forward and solve problems in the world. Um, that's my first thought. Raja, what you thinking? <laughs> oh my gosh, so many thoughts. <laughs> all, I know I have like a minute left. First of all, I remember when COVID first hit, I, I in travel sort of stopped everything slowed down and I remember thinking is this sort of like where mother earth gets to literally take a breath and have yeah. sort of this resurgence and sort of correct some of the things that we've done so as devastating as COVID is and also I want to talk about that sustainability problem but as devastating as it is it has sort of slowed us down and forced us to make these rapid u-turns in how we operate in ways that we previously were so stubbornly against these adaptabilities that we have sacrificed work-life balance, we've sacrificed parts of the planet because we had to do it this way. And what COVID did was force us to realize that we should be able to adapt and that adaptability has now opened up and afforded people that are in different communities, especially if we're thinking about people and um, from an accessibility standpoint, folks who previously weren't able to attend certain events, functions, or whatever, because we had to hold an in-person meeting across the country from an economic standpoint, from a physical disability standpoint, and I'm talking about vision impairment, audio impairment, um, you know, physical whatever, we have never been, except for the ADA Act, been forced to address those. 
the minute that everyone else was stuck within these like digital platforms because they were stuck at home working or schooling or whatever, suddenly we made these things much more accessible. We had captions programs that suddenly were able to do voice capture much more efficiently and create captions. Um, we have events that have sign language interpreters. Um, we now suddenly we have people that were previously unable to participate in events, meetings and conversations that are now able to um, engage in that dialogue. And so the design of the things that we do have has improved wholeheartedly. It's forced us to take a break from the planet. But the whole reason that, you know, if you're going back to some of like the origin theories around COVID, a lot of that was due to this interspecies contact that would not have happened if we weren't clear cutting forests and coming into contact with species that we had no business being around anyway. Maybe one person walked through the woods would have seen but we have put ourselves in this position where we're very much more vulnerable and susceptible to come in contact with some of these unknown viruses and contagions. Even if you're looking at the, you know, the tundra melting and they're talking about, you know, millennia old spores that had been buried under ice for millions of years are now going to be entering our atmosphere. What is that going to start to do, right? So because of our behavior in the last 200 years and how cavalier we have been with our planet, thinking that it can take this beating, um, we've really put ourselves in a vulnerable position. So I think that I am hoping that people will reflect on that and realize that we can't not continue in the same way we have and that we are able to adapt just as quickly as nature is in, in when we're facing with these huge hurdles and obstacles and be able to convert the way that we operate in the world into a much more sustainable way. And I'm hoping that we will continue to look at natural systems as inspiration on how we can solve some of those problems that we, we, we create, we've created really um, as we move forward. Awesome. Well, um, I could talk to both of you about this for a very long time. It's, it's good to see you all. Um, Thank you so much for joining. Um, and uh, we hope we left our audience with uh, tools and methods to look at nature in new ways, some inspiration. Um, please go, uh, go solve the world's problems. <laughs> um, we'll be uh, posting this link on our YouTube page and our website, This Is Harmonic. Um, thank you so much, Anne and Raja. Really appreciate it. And thanks to our audience. Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.